We're talking social justice. We're talking controversy. We're talking how to be nice to people. This is the We're Libertarians Daily Podcast. I am your host, Hody Johns. I'm actually joined by the specialist guest of all, Woody Johns. That last name is not a coincidence. That's my brother. Woody, how are you doing today? Man, I'm so happy to be here. Also, the weird first name, not a coincidence either. He started it, though. He's the oldest. His fault. Yeah, Just the Hody, the Woody, and what's the name of that other brother we have? I don't know, but he makes a good beer. <laughs> so uh, Woody's uh, going to get intoxicated while we do this here. Uh, if if Bucky, our other brother, brewed that beer any good, at least, Woody will be getting intoxicated during this podcast. Woo! Uh, thanks for joining us. So Woody is a proponent of social justice, and it's something that we haven't talked about here on the podcast very often, if ever, before. Uh, and so we have a lot of preconceived notions, and so if you think you know what it is, let go of it real quick, because Woody is a smart dude, and he will blow your mind on the concept. So, uh, Woody, give, give me the uh, elevator pitch crash course. What's social justice? All right. Let me give it to you. So, the basic belief is that everyone deserves the same access to liberty and human decency. The idea of social justice is that it's impacted by... So many things, race, religion, uh, class, your financial upbringing, factors that are outside of your control, and that social justice believes that that impact should be lessened, that everyone should have that same access to liberty, that same access to opportunity, and the ability to change and guide their life no matter what. Okay, so I'm freaking out. If I'm going to lessen that impact, does that mean I have to use the force of government? Can libertarians not be social justice people? Now, you got to understand, social justice, that's talking about what do we want to see? What do we want that impact to be? There's debate among social justice people who just how do we get that done? There's there's the idea of awareness. There's the idea of legislating that. And that is a wonderful debate to have because I think everyone can agree Everyone is deserving of that same access. Everyone should have those basic human rights. It's kind of really important. Uh, yeah, and I think human rights is something that most libertarians can, can absolutely get on board with. Uh, now, if we're to take the non-government route with that, how, how would we get on board with social justice if we're going to say, well, we're libertarians, we don't like to use the force of government to limit anything, Plus, they tend to abuse it and make things more unequal when we try to get it to be equal. So how do I go about it if I'm not comfortable using the government way of creating that equality? Well, if you're not going to legislate it, which is kind of the way to go, if you ask me, the way to do it is through you got to set up social awareness. You got to get the truth out there. You have to really work to get that just to get the understanding out there. I... I didn't believe in any of this stuff until I became a teacher and I got to see it firsthand and I got to study it. And it, it was just, you need to have an open dialogue with both parties talking back and forth, discussing it. This is a, an issue that belongs to everyone in society. It's not to any one person or one group of people. It's something that just for the goodness and fairness of mankind, we got to work together to do. How do you do it? Well, it's it's a social problem that I think should be solved socially. So let's get into the specifics then. Can you give me an example of maybe a problem that we've socially taken that's that's made strides forward? I think it's hard to say we've taken care of and completely completely eradicated any social issue, especially globally. But is there one that you can say, oh, we have definitely helped create equality. Here was the problem and, and here's how, how we've come thanks to kind of socially attacking that problem? Sure thing. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about jobs and genders, how you know, still nowadays we have the stereotype. If I say, oh, picture a leader, picture an engineer, picture a nurse, picture an elementary school teacher, you still just kind of stereotype genders into these roles. But my wife is an engineer. I was a second grade teacher for a few years. It's and now I'm a stay at home dad. We've come so far to the point where it's no longer uh, breaking many barriers to be these things it's still of interest which that's fine but we've come that far the way that we've done it is well 
honestly, for economic good, it's not right to pigeonhole genders into certain jobs. And boy, uh, I'm really throwing it back to World War II when the men went off to war, the women were left behind to start doing factory jobs. I know that's kind of a bit of a throwback, but that's really when the idea of, hey, guess who can also do these jobs? Everybody really started to make that impact. And it's a journey that we're still going through. It's There's still stereotypes that are being broken, but I don't. I can safely say that there is no job that's just completely without access to anyone based on gender. That's a good example. That's a good example. So I think when we get apprehensive about it, we just we. I, I think especially as libertarians, we start naturally thinking about force, and especially in the case of say affirmative action, and say i mean you your wife's even in engineering and uh our father is in engineering and so we've got uh, some of those in the family and i remember him telling me a story where he said well you know affirmative action they say take the ben- test ben app- best applicants that are men and the 10 best applicants who are women and i've got 20 applicants here from women and 2000 from men would you say that's a net good or bad is it necessary unnecessary what are like i guess You do a lot of exploring on both sides of the debate on this. Kind of give me a well-rounded view on what you think of that. So I completely understand the desire for affirmative action. I am essentially against it, but I, I understand the need for a problem. This is a systemic problem. It perpetuates itself. Uh, For example, if there's less women taking engineering jobs, then there's less women who are bound to become engineers. It's seen as less of an opportunity for them. Uh, So for example, uh, let's say um, in 2014, um, 66% of Hispanics uh, who got a job or entered the military directly after high school uh, said that they needed to do it to support their family. And that's why they didn't enroll in any college uh, compared with 39% of whites. And it's, it's a problem that's systemic. It perpetuates itself. The opportunity for financial mobility for those Hispanics is just eroded because of this. And I understand the desire for just uh, affirmative action, just this shortcut that maybe in a few generations, if we just force this through, then we'll have uh, more people of incredibly diverse backgrounds so that anyone can easily see themselves in that role. I am still personally against it, but I understand that desire. It's something that, well, it's worth a debate. It's worth talking about. And we're doing a good job at that. If you ask me. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and and I'm going to take, and and here's the thing, I'm against affirmative action as well. Anytime somebody tries to forcibly get any company to do anything, I think it's wrong, but I'll say this. I think that there is a benefit to diversity after a certain point. I think we can say, well, I took all the most qualified people. They all tended to be white males. And surprise, surprise, you know, 10 years later, my company ends ends up in this fringe direction that is, you know, populated only by, you know, white supremacists and Nazis. And it's like, well, I didn't intend to do that. It's like, well, yeah, but you, you created that loophole and nobody closed it off. And so even if it's not the government shutting it down, it still is something that we need to say, look, we're libertarians, right? Which means we believe in liberty. This is not just an anti-government movement. This is a pro-liberty movement. And so that's very important to understand that socially we need to be able to be inclusive towards these people, be understanding. The, the statistics you gave about the Hispanics, that's devastating. Because here they are taking these government jobs, doing these military interventions that we don't want them to do, generally as libertarians. If we offer them more options, more of these free market options, and not just because it's a free market, but socially encourage them to do so or tell them that they can, that they are able to do that or see that they're in a financial situation where they don't have to do it, we significantly decrease the strength of the government in the power over their lives. Because now it's going to be tough to get that Hispanic sway over to the libertarian side because suddenly they're thinking, 
well, that's my lifeblood. That's I, I don't know how to support my family outside of that. So this is why I'm joining the military. So when we talk about decreasing the size of the military from a libertarian point of view, you're talking about affecting their jobs. So how do we get their lives off of the line? Well, maybe socially encourage them to join some, you know, join different programs. So uh, I think that it is important to talk about. It's definitely worth the debate. I will debate anybody on the issue, especially uh, uh, affirmative action. Uh, but I think there's no doubt that there is some value to diversity that's beyond just the, I took all the best and most qualified applicants and here's who they were. And th this is an issue that uh, I've been against and at other times I've been for. I, it's, it is something that I don't know the answer. It's something that we need to continue working on. But yes, absolutely, we just need to get everyone into the workforce, everyone into a free market, everyone to have that equal access to the opportunity to pursue whatever they want, whatever they're passionate in. If someone works towards something that they believe in, that they want to do, that they aren't being forced to do just because of their, you know, their social class, because uh, they're afraid to do anything else, Everyone benefits when people are working towards what they care about instead of just working towards whatever they can get without feeling oppressed, without feeling like they're letting down their family, without feeling like financially they can't handle anything else. This is – it's an important issue and social justice in my head is the movement towards that openness. So let's take a look at a very current real life example that I've noticed. Uh, airlines are very hesitant to hire female pilots. And as a result, nobody, no females want to take that role to get their pilot's license because the job's not really there for them. And it's funny that it's seen that way because we're aware just because of statistics that men are, or women are better drivers than men by and large. It's a, I don't love all stereotypes. I think we should all be treated with like people. And I don't, I wouldn't say I support, you know, them getting lower insurance rates than us, but that cuts all ways in saying that my advantage is that I might say is that a man, I shouldn't be given priority over a construction job over a woman and just assume that I can lift more than she can until I actually prove it on the job. And so I think it's sad that we have these <coughs> stereotypes that still exist even today in this, especially among gender roles, to say, well, I mean, it's wrong. I shouldn't say especially among gender roles. It's absolutely among race roles, too. But, it, you know, when I look at the pilot thing and I'm like, boy, statistically, they're probably better flyers than men. And yet it's dominated almost entirely by the male market. Now, as a social justice thinking person, what's something that we could do socially to kind of discourage people from perpetuating that stereotype and encouraging people to, to hire female pilots or any other examples that you can think of? So one issue that's, goodness, it's just dicey, is the idea of implicit bias. It's the idea just that you can unfairly judge groups of people without actually thinking that. You don't have to be a white supremacist or misogynist to become, uh, to sort of contribute to this system. I, people don't think, oh, women pilot, well, well, there goes the neighborhood. No one's actually, okay, some people are thinking that, but but Yeah, we'll uh, let them be the Republicans and join the White House, and then, and then we're talking about all the rest of us. Right, they can yeah, you know, they can go and uh, flourish in their own party there. But uh, yeah, um, so I feel like if people are aware of their own of their own biases or the idea that these biases exist, it allows them to uh, recognize that in themselves and to work on them. It's and to me the one of the most stereotypical stereotypically like off-color things to say if you're doing something that a social justice person might not be okay with is to say like, oh, it's okay. I've got to insert the blank here, friend. But truly, that is the best way to, to even think about these issues or to have uh, black friends, women friends, and talk to them and try to figure out what things are from their experience. If 
I'm the only one whose personal experience I'm paying attention to. Look at this. It's not going to be a really out there answer. I am a very privileged person to be where I am. But if you can actually find yourself invested in your friends, invested in people who you care about, invested in people who are concerned with this, if you open up a dialogue with them, truly wishing the best for them, you want them to pursue what they want to do. Absolutely, that is one huge step that is forward, is understanding that even if you do not consciously think it, there is bias, even if it's not in you, it might be in people around you to understand that that's just the unconscious thinking that can pervade our society. So for, first things first, I have your permission to say, well, I have a black friend, so it's cool. <laughs> yeah, you have permission to say, I've talked it over with my black friend. And then you should probably also refer to him by name. <laughs> that just seems, it seems a little bit, categorizing me like oh it's okay i got a black no right. you can say uh, you can say hey i talked it over with my friend who's black and actually has thought about this and experienced this sort of oppression whereas if i think about like oh wow kansas city they were uh, you know three times as many black people were pulled over and stopped for uh, it's just like minor violations that weren't actually dangerous to anybody I'm not going to have much of, of an opinion on it, but for someone who's actually lived with that sort of oppression, absolutely. It's going to, it's going to hit them more than it's going to hit me. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And it's something that I think statistically it's hard to get away from. I think it's easy to say, well, that's just that community that's over here. Well, that community is a culture, you know, like, yeah, maybe we don't, we're not trying to condemn all white people or white culture, whatever you want to call it. You know, we're not kind of trying, nobody's trying to condemn good masculinity. It's areas where it's toxic. And you, you, if you are not the person who's toxic, well, they're not talking to you then. Like we're, we're showing examples of people getting beat up and bullying each other and people smacking gr the girls they don't know on the butts and demeaning their ideas in the workplace because they're women. That's toxic masculinity. So I think, a lot of times people get offended when they hear it because they're like, whoa, what about the masculinity is toxic? Well, I, I think it's pretty self-evident. And I think if you are saying that, well, I don't have toxic masculinity, well then, yeah, we're not talking to you. Uh, so it's okay to just be like, yeah, that's a problem, but it's not one that I struggle with. If you, But take a step further, maybe you should join the social justice cause and say, I am also going to come condemn that if I see that toxic behavior. One of the issues that I have is I'm in an area where that is so foreign to me, where this whole rape culture is foreign to me. I, if I saw, if I or anybody that I know saw some but guy raping a girl or sexually assaulting a girl, like we beat him up and stab him to death. I mean, it's it's not, it's not that specific thing is not an issue here. We got other culture issue, issues out here in Utah, believe me, but that specifically is not an issue. However. I watched this video with these five guys in Hollywood that are talking to each other and they're talking about the Me Too movement and how it's changed them. And this one guy was talking about how he saw one of his buddies raping a girl and the girls like scream for help and he was in with a bunch of his other buddies and they're like, we didn't know what to do. And I'm like, what? for me, that's so foreign, but like, that's a real thing. I mean... Larry Nassar, the, the Olympic doctor, I mean, he got reported hundreds, hundreds of times. He got away with raping like 200 or sexually assaulting, molesting, whatever, 200 plus women before somebody finally put a stop to it. And so, yes, it, maybe it's not your culture and er your area, but that doesn't mean it's not a culture everywhere. I mean, you look at Charlotte and how many places do you think... Do you? I don't live in a district where the KKK would be able to petition the govern the state government or local government and get a parade. I don't live there, but that's not where they're at in Charlotte. You know, that's just a that's just a different different situation they've got going on over there. You brought something else 
up that I uh, wanted to talk about. Now I'm spacing it. You're talking about how, okay, we don't have a black friend. We, you know, you say I've talked to them. This isn't my token friend. This is like him and his experiences. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of my feeling with him and, when we talk about it. Sorry, go ahead. And another important thing with that is, you know, uh, so it's important to talk to people who have experienced that impression. And you, it's absolutely a no good thing to discount personal experience even if like let's say you're talking to your friend and they say i've never experienced that that's never happened to me you cannot discount that yeah just like you said in your area of utah of you know, people have different experiences and it's okay to understand oh hey if someone else is like Talking to me, if someone's trying to say, tell me, like, this is what oppression is like where you are, if that's not the case, it's, you know, you cannot discount personal experience, even if it's, you know, even if it doesn't align with the classic social justice way of, like, oh, well, here's how, here's who was oppressed by who, and here's what's going on. Like you said, every place has a different culture, and you have to work on what, what counts to you, what matters in, commu- in your community. For me in Denver, I it's where I really fostered more of an idea of uh, uh, feminism. It is sort of my it was my original gateway into social justice, and it really it, it went up when I became a stay at home dad because I realized that this whole idea of like balancing the gender roles it. It's something that every social justice cause is compatible with each other. There's the sort of infamous men's rights activist group who they'll try to talk about their troubles of being a man, but do it by like tearing down feminism as opposed to a a group that I really follow and absolutely love is the men's liberation, which talks, they'll talk about toxic masculinity. They'll talk about real problems of being a man, it, absolutely. By being a man, there are problems that you experience that women don't. It's it's okay to say that. This is your personal experience. This is my personal experience. I, I'm a stay-at-home dad of three kids, and people constantly say that I'm babysitting them, and I got my hands full. It's like, oh, well, it must be mom's day off. No, this is my job. And it's that's my personal experience. It's uh, It's just that we're focused on opposing those restraints that are put on men for the men's liberation, which is completely, yeah, it's completely congruent with uh, the goals of feminism is we is just figuring this out, taking off those restraints and giving us that access to Liberty, to be who we want to be, to pursue those goals. You were already going to be super unpopular, just people knowing you were a social justice warrior. So admitting that you're a feminist, I was going to save that for like another <laughs> podcast. But like, I, I am sure you, you, I told you you probably wouldn't get much, you know, much anger in the social media. You're going to get anger in social media. Now. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. I'm also a Gryffindor, so you know, making friends in one way, making enemies in another. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, so let's let's like address this head on here because I think you talked about men's liberation. I love them because this is not an assault on masculinity because I think that especially men's liberation, they'll be like, dude, let's be a man. It takes a ton of guts to stand up when everybody around you is being sexist or demeaning somebody. And it is extremely masculine to be like, heck no, like that's not cool and I'm not going to let that happen. Now, pick, you know, pick and choose what actually happens in your area. Obviously, look out for it. Um, but if it is happening in your area, be aware. You know, if it's not something that happens in your area, there's no wrong with, nothing wrong with encouraging it or making sure it doesn't happen or regress. Um, it, it, you know, in, in your environment, in your community, when you see that type of thing, this is the type of, this is what we want, you know. Uh, so so it's not an assault on masculinity. It's not an assault on whiteness. 
It's just saying, you know, and, and you talk about that tearing down thing where they say, well, I have to tear it down. Look, white people don't tear down black people. Black people, let's not tear down white people. Like, why don't we all just try to get on that equal footing and let's have that footing be as high as it possibly can. I absolutely do not believe that rights have to come at the expense of somebody else's rights. Yes, maybe there's a specific job that only has like five openings or something like that, but this is not a matter of your rights coming at somebody else's rights. This is, we want to get to a place one day where people like my dad can take the top 20 applicants and have them be a mix of men and women. Because women are just as qual. I mean, we've se you've seen it. You're married to one. Women are just as qualified to be engineers as men. So they just don't tend towards that field, and so we should be encouraging them to get involved in those types of fields, and not discouraging men if they are engineers from getting less involved. I have been to a job fair before. Engineers are in crazy high demand. So, like, you do not need to worry about getting a job as an engineer. Maybe that perfect job you want might be a little tougher, but uh, I digress on that one. Um, what I did want to say is let's let's talk... Uh, my biggest hang-up with being a... I know we talked about this before the show anyway, but my biggest hang-up with being a social justice warrior, people that call themselves social justice, is I just have this stereotype in my head. And so I'm going to talk... I'm going to bring up a couple examples of the stereotype and you just tell me what you think is going on there. If it's something that, yeah, it's social justice, but it's bad or good, or, or just just give me your thoughts on it. So, Absolutely, I can do that. So let's take the example of the. Let, let's go crazy first. Let's take uh, just this last week we had the shaved headed girl <laughs> crying at that black guy wearing the MAGA hat, right? And she's like, "I'm scared of your hat. Like, don't you see that hat is." scaring me and frightening me so what's she scared of what's going on is there something we should do socially is she just a nut so okay uh i guess a true warrior opens up a dialogue i'm just gonna say that and that's going to be a common thing that i'm going to say because what she's saying is just she's closing everything down she's not trying to figure out what's our common ground like she's not trying to explain hey, I think that your hat represents a guy who kind of fundamentally disagrees with you. Yeah, she's not saying anything like that. She's just saying, oh, I'm scared. Now, I haven't seen this video, but I, from the way it's been described, it's, there's no dialogue going on. And it's, I don't know, I'm kind of wondering who was filming that and what their point was other than to be, I don't know. Everyone loves to throw up a straw man of the social justice warrior, but... You know, at least we got the term warrior because that sounds like such a cool term. I mean, <laughs> come on. I want to grab my social justice cleric and social justice druid and, you know, bash some heads. That sounds great. Social but, justice D&D. &D. Like, that's nothing right. better than that. The, I, and so that's a good point with the straw man because when I bring up these examples, this is something that turns me off of it. But it is straw manning it. You find bad examples of people everywhere. There are bad libertarians. There are bad men. There are bad women. There are bad uh, Republicans. There are bad Democrats. I know I'm going, I'm jumping between like ethnicities and genders and beliefs, but the thing is I can't just point to that and say that's what all of it is. Now, I think the issue I had, and especially before I talked to you, I was going to say met you, but <laughs> that's been our whole <laughs> lives. But before I really talked with you about it and what you learned about it, the stereotypes were all I knew because the stereotypes were really what I'd come across. And maybe it's, be it's partly because of the culture that I'm in. I haven't had that rape culture, manpower culture, women suck culture. I haven't had that in my life. I haven't even been discriminated based on my weird Mormon religion. I mean, I just, I have not had many problems that people have. And so for me, I'm like, well, I don't see too much need for it. And then I see girls like that, like having a total meltdown and they can't even discuss it. And then I see CNN, 
or MSNBC or Fox News or any of the major networks. And every so often they'll have a panelist, they'll be talking about feminism, and they'll be like, why is this man invited to talk about feminism? Get him out of here. He's not allowed to have an opinion on this. Guys can't have an opinion on abortion. That's women's bodies. Like that's, and for me, that's what, that's what feminism, that's what social justice warrior, that's what it is. That's what it was, I guess. And so I wanted to bring you on the show because we're in kind of the closing leg here. I wanted to bring you on the show to kind of talk about it because it always seems like common sense when I talk to you and then I go out and I look at social media and I'm like, these people are insane. But social media rewards the insane, right? You get more reacts, good or bad, you get more reacts and you're at the top of people's feeds. You know, YouTube measures by like, well, here's the most commonly viewed videos. They're the crazy ones. They're the nutty ones. This is why so, this is why like things like global warming got blown out of pro, out of proportion. There's hundreds and hundreds of people that believe in global warming that don't think that the world is going to end in 12 years. And then you've got Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and like two scientists that really wanted to publish a journal and get famous. And what do we have? The left thinks the world's going to end in 12 years, in spite of the the thousands of other journals that they're like, yeah, it's warming. No, it's not going to end in 12 years. The world focuses and says, this is what the left believes. Because one person on the left said it, and one study confirmed it without peer review. And this is what happens with social justice warriors, too. I don't think Woody, if you truly gave him an open mind, said anything that you would fundamentally disagree with as a libertarian. I know I didn't hear anything. And it's something that we want to encourage. This <laughs> equality, this open-minded, this, this encouragement for people to seek other lines of work but it becomes something else because you find somebody nutty or you see somebody nutty doing something dumb they claim to be a social justice warrior they get that label attached to them and suddenly that's everybody yeah i know you've had this problem with with when you talk about feminism how you're basically defending the same 12 quotes from like five crazy radical feminists that talk about putting men in, te in tubes and farming them for sperm and then you look at Wikipedia. actually I'm all for that one I'm just, I'm just kidding I'm not oh, please <laughs> we're, we're in serious mode you can't see I'm, no. I'm sorry you're my brother how am I supposed to be serious man <laughs> but you get, you get that and then but that's like five women and then you look on Wikipedia that like list of, of you know notable feminists and there's thousands of them and I don't know, it, maybe do we, do we need to be stronger in condemning those statements, like cleaning out our own, like to be like, yeah, that person's embraced some kind of strange, weird ideology. You talked about social justice meaning opening up a dialogue. And I've given you two examples of when people shut down dialogues. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, what do we do? So, okay, three things that I do want to say, just because time. All right. A true warrior opens up a dialogue. A true warrior works towards a solution and a true warrior keeps their chin up. I'm sure I'll get to all those in a second. But yes, we need to open up a dialogue. That means that if you're trying to, if you're bringing attention to something, it's to stir up awareness, not to stir up anger or any other kind of emotion. Because emotional responses just entrench people on the different sides that they're on. It doesn't open up a dialogue. It shuts things down and even if someone is saying something offensive if they're bringing it up it's it's important if they're not being a troll it's important to talk about that people need a space to be able to discuss like hey uh, i need help on this opinion that i have or this belief that i have i need to be able to talk about it without just if you without being berated for even bringing it up it, so um, so for example, like, oh, you're a man, you shouldn't be here. That's, that's, that's not starting anything. That's just shutting anything down. That's, you know, e even if they think that a man doesn't have as much say in a certain topic, that's not a dialogue. That is a complete close the door on them, which doesn't work. You need to, hey, number two, find a solution, work towards a solution find common ground with them. You're not going to find someone that's interested in discussing who truly doesn't believe that everyone's deserving of access to liberty 
and basic human dignity. People are going to agree with you on that. And if you work up from there, it's all going to be, hey, how do we reach this point? Some people believe one thing, some people believe another. And But if you start at that common ground, there you go. If you started by, if you started with anger, if you started with fear, if you started by just a finger at the door, it's that's not working towards a solution. A, a true warrior has that outcome in mind. What do you want to see happen? What are you trying to say? If you're just arguing without any idea of what you want that outcome to be, that's just called shouting, and that's not actually getting anywhere. That's, you can. That's called CNN, technically. No, okay. I I always wondered what that acronym was for, and <laughs> uh, and then it keeps their chin up. I, I know that you talked about that one example where the uh, um um there was the journalist who said, "Oh, you can't you can't say that because you have white privilege. That's the only reason you're saying it." And well, they didn't have this nice handy dandy video that you and I have apparently because they were talking to a black man and telling them that they have white privilege is, well, it's wrong. Uh, so the number third thing, you got to keep your chin up. You got to say, hey, I messed up. I was wrong. And in that case, absolutely. They were wrong. They had the, you know, they were trying to discount the personal experience of someone who had been through their own thing and they yeah, uh, one thing that I will kind of give towards the poor, uninformed person is they apologized. They said they messed up. And those are two very important things if you're going to talk to anyone. If they can't say that they're wrong at something, if they can't say, oh, I messed up, then they're not worth talking she, she to. She was very careful to say her sources were wrong, but the white privilege thing stands. Yeah, the sources, because... We can have a whole other podcast about how to craft a real right. sincere apology, but I'll let you continue because we haven't even gotten to keeping your chin up yet. Well, this is part of keeping your chin up is admitting when you're wrong. And the other one is just is has to do with what you say, what you said about Strawman. If you're being misrepresented, misrepresented, you just can't give up. You have to you have to rise above. There will always be a louder person that is very wrong and claims to be on your side. That is that's just how things go. But let me tell you, I have I have never met any of these, you know, the people that you've described as sort of having the radical beliefs. I I know a lot of people who have joined on my social justice uh, order of justice to take out the dungeons of discrimination who have joined on my quest and none of them are anything like this. I if you read the journalists, if you read, uh, if you talk to people who you actually know person to person, you're probably not going to find the people that are on that, well, more radical end of the spectrum. And if they do, well, let's just hope that they're working towards a solution. And that solution doesn't involve me being in a tube. <laughs> yeah, I, the dialogue is important. I love all three of those points. I think uh, that's that's cool to, that you get to be called a warrior for doing those. Uh, I, I, it's definitely a label you want to wear. Nobody wants to not be a warrior or be a sissy. Because real sissies do shut off the dialogue. I mean, really, that's that's what it is. When you see the, the people crying or the people uh, you know on these debates that want to win the debate by not having the debate at all, that's being a sissy. That's, that's not being, being a, sissy. a warrior. warrior. You know, and then... Embracing that victim mentality, getting sad, saying, "Oh, this is my this is my lot in life." Again, that's what sissies do. We're talking right. about, I mean, manning up, womaning up. We're talking about being a warrior and and fighting it through. There is something, and I don't want to make it sound like Utah is the perfect land. People should move here if they want to avoid all all social issues. I've never once seen anybody tell my girlfriend to smile, but Jamie gets told to smile almost daily by somebody. They don't do it in front of me because they know it's jacked up because they know I would say something. And so it's uh, now gr granted, uh, Jamie has resting. <coughs> and that's, that's something, 
but we're talking about you know people being like oh you should smile you know and that was that was something they talked about in the Gillette ad and something that that's like no like why are you asking them to betray their emotions that's dumb and they know better than to do it in front of me a guy because they know I would do something about it so there's still stuff to do even out here in Utah that people being acted acting messed up and thinking that they can get away with it and it happens to like I said it happens there on a daily basis so there's th there's still solutions there's still things we need to attack and accomplish so I would just say and we're gonna wrap up on this podcast Woody I'm actually gonna you the last word because I'm gonna do my last word now all right you cannot ignore a problem to death it doesn't go away even when we take free market solutions a guy like Ray Kroc, who I have like a lot of respect for, I, I read this economy book and, and he had a, um, a lot of writings about it. He embraced serving all people at McDonald's way before he had to legally do it. But he still had to intentionally do it. He still had to stand against his community. So while I love the lazy fair side of libertarianism, and I would never ask you to, to abandon that side, there is a cultural activity that we need to have if we're going to kill things like sexism, racism, misogyny, whatever it may be for good, religiousism, whatever you discriminate people, you know, against people, non-smilingisms. We need to kill that with culture and with intent. It's not something that goes away. It becomes an epidemic if you don't do something about it. The thing about libertarianisms. The reason I wanted you on the show so bad, Woody, is we need to not – we need to embrace some amount of social justice because here's the thing. If racism gets worse and people do nothing about it, they're going to form a government to do something about it. We don't want affirmative action to have to exist. So what's the solution to that? Creating a culture and a society in which people don't feel the need to do something like that. Because they say, oh, there's plenty of diversification in this. And so that they can look in it and say, that's okay. Look, people are going to become more equal and more free. But this isn't because we shamed them to death or ignored them to death. This is because we embraced them until they, until they saw it as an option. I don't want these Hispanics joining the military. I want them joining the free market. I don't want them seeing this as the only way out to support their families. I want them to be able to say, wow, I had a lot of encouragement my, from, from society to say this is what I can do, whatever they want. Look, you, if you're listening to this podcast, there's no way you're a racist because Harry is our other host on the main show. And, and if you didn't know this, he's black. So I'm sorry if we lose any viewers because of that. But guess what? That's a matter of fact. So look, I get it. You're probably not one of the hood-wearing KKK guys. But let's try to take the next step because we are not going to win if we only have the numbers we have and refuse to embrace the problems that the right or the left sees or re we refuse to embrace this diversification uh, i had a friend tell me the other day to be honest with you before i met you i thought the libertarian party was a bunch of old white christians and now i understand that there's some middle-aged white christians as well <laughs> and that's but that's how it's seen. And so the issue is, is we need to culturally encourage these people. Do you think you're going to shame black people to joining the cause of liberty when they have a solution in government that seem that they think is working for them? Absolutely not. We can display all day why we think that's slavery, but that's no good. That's not going to that they will turn to that solution every time until we create, create a culture within the liberty movement that is so strong that makes them say, I don't need government to do this for me. I'm doing fine on my own. And so that's that is my words. Woods, I'm going to let you have the last laugh here. However long you want, just say what you want. You know, I think you got as far as we need to create that culture that accepts people, that wants them to achieve as much potential as they want to achieve. That just uh, something that 
fights systemic oppression because systemic it doesn't go away it continues it perpetuates it sometimes gets worse if it's left untreated it's something that we need to talk about to bring into the light and yes if you're working on bringing people into libertarianism absolutely they need to see that it can be done without the cause of government right now both parties sort of see legislation as their weapon as opposed to any sort of cultural change that they are trying to achieve they're trying to make cultural change by writing it on into law which time and time again government has not exactly been proven to be a very trustworthy keeper of morality it, they it's in the interest of goodness and fairness for everyone social justice aims to give everyone that access, that opportunity, the chance to do everything that they can. And yes, I currently believe that that's a cultural, that the solution is a cultural one. And no matter what you believe, if there's someone who believes that it should be legislated, good, go to them, talk to them. You need to open up a dialogue. You need to have an outcome in mind, you need to keep your chin up. This is how you do things. This is how a true warrior tries to right the wrongs that are in this world today. It's not by hoping that you've got a majority in this house that can get this thing through. You need to talk to the people. You need to work with the culture that you are trying to change or else that systemic oppression is just going to be an heirloom that's passed on through the law that everyone can see and say, well, that that's there and it's not going to change. This needs to be something that is in the history books, but that is not in the constitution. That's my opinion there. Awesome. Woods, thanks for giving us some uh, libertarian rules for radicals. I, I like it. The, uh, you know, we're going to become revolutionaries here. So, uh, again, if you are tuning in, I really appreciate you making it all the way through. Uh, thanks for uh, joining. Please join the Patreon. Let us know. Support us financially so that we can keep getting on great guests, amazing guests like this one. And uh, we're just going to keep being, keep fighting for liberty for all. So thanks again for joining the show, guys, and I will talk to you next time.